In today's video, I'm going to be talking all about craft markets because it is definitely something I've been asked many times to create a video on and to share my tips about. And it's something that can be really scary as a small business owner for many reasons. You've never done it before. There's costs involved sometimes, as well as what do you take and all the other things in between. So we're going to be talking all about those in today's video. And as someone who has experienced both sides of craft markets and events, I have a lot of tips to share. So I have planned and managed craft markets and events, and I have also with my own small business participated in them. So I have tons and tons of tips to share with you today. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, let's start off with how much does it cost to do craft market? Now, there's no kind of general rule. It depends on the size of the market, what type of market it is. But a kind of guideline to at least get you kind of started is a stand or a table at a craft market can cost anywhere from like £10 to £100 plus. And the cost, like I say, will depend on the type of market, like how many stands they have, as well as the size of the actual event. So typically the more expensive ones have a larger footfall, meaning there's more people that attend that event, hence they have a larger fee. And the process works that you will either buy a stand or you'll have to apply for a stand. Again, it depends on the type of market that is being advertised. But a general rule of thumb, if it has an application that you need to fill out, this is typically a more professional, sometimes better run event. And it tends to have a reasonably good footfall, especially in terms of like advertising it to people. And because of this, it tends to be quite attractive in terms of there'll be lots of people applying to participate and have a stand or a table, hence there's an application form. And the organisers also do this to kind of vet stands to make sure that the business owners are obviously professional and trustworthy, running an ethical business. And it also helps them pick a range of products so that not everyone at the event sells jewellery unless it is a specific jewellery event. Because especially if it's like a craft market or an artisan market, um, they will want a range range of products available. So don't let any application forms put you off or seem super daunting or scary. Sometimes it is just like kind of filling out your basic business information, like what you do, your name, address, etc. Sometimes they'll want more information. So this tends to be for the larger events or definitely the more popular events. And when you apply, they might ask for things like insurance details and you might even have to provide a risk assessment. So the cost of insurance will depend again on where you are in the world, what you sell, as well as information based on like how big a stand you're doing, so for instance, if you're just having a table at a craft market and you're just going to be doing those, you won't need as much insurance as if you did like a big exhibition. And craft markets want insurance details from you so that if someone trips over your table leg and decides to sue you or the event, obviously the event will have their own as well. Um, they know that you are covered as well as they are covered. And if any accidents or damage happens, you have the insurance to deal with that too. If you're in the UK and looking for a small business kind of craft market insurance, I'll leave a few examples in the description. And then another thing to think about in terms of the actual event is obviously the cost of getting there. So the petrol in your car or someone else's car potentially um, in terms of getting there and back. And especially if it's a multi-day event, obviously you're going to have that multiple times. So moving on then, what to take to a craft market. So again, this will depend on kind of what craft market you're doing or the size of it. But I have a bit of a checklist to kind of give you an idea of things that you're going to want to take. And I split these into four helpful categories, with the first one being your stand furniture. And of course, the amount of furniture that you take will depend on the type of event and the size of your space, as it were. So craft markets, sometimes you're given a table, sometimes you're not. Again, this will come down to reading the information about the specific craft event to know whether it's included or not. If you're in the UK and you're given a table, it's typically a kind of six foot trestle table. Think along the lines, the one with like the foldable legs. So it can handle a bit of weight, but not too much. So obviously, if you're provided one, you don't need to take one. But if you're not, you'll need to buy one and take one. So other things to think about if you just have kind of a traditional kind of table craft market is a tablecloth. Again, double check if this is provided or not. It's also just a good idea to take one because sometimes they say it's provided and someone forgets. But also this is your chance, and we'll get into this section later, to stand out from the other people at this craft fair in terms of having a different colour or even having a branded tablecloth. 
Now, obviously, for your first time, you don't need this. You can try it out, and that might be something that you purchase later on. Now, something I also recommend is taking a bar stool or a high chair, not a kid's high chair. We're not talking kids here, but chairs typically, like I'm on a chair right now, they're quite low and it hides you behind your table. And it's not the best look in terms of, like I say, you're hidden or you're kind of just sat back relaxing. Maybe you're on your phone. It doesn't give off the best impression. So I prefer to recommend things like bar stools because it heightens you up above your table, but also gives you that ability to interact with customers as well as rest, because rest is very important during long days of craft fairs. Then if it's an outdoor event, so if it's on a field or whatever, like a farmer's market, you might also need to take a gazebo. Not only will this protect you from rain, but also it can protect you obviously from the sun's heat if you're gonna be out all day. Now you can get gazebos without walls and just the top and obviously the protective poles to hold it up. But especially if you're going to be outdoors, consider getting one with walls. Not only does this help protect your stuff from rain um, and also some damage if it's hot, but also if it's windy, that's really going to protect you as well. And then depending again on the weather, you might want to invest in some weights or some pegs to securely fasten your gazebo into the ground so that especially on windy days, it doesn't go flying off which believe me, even with some heavy gazebos, I've seen it happen. So that's kind of a basics in terms of actually kitting out your stand with the bare minimum. Moving on then to the second category, and that is your table dressings and branding elements. In this category, you want to be thinking about how are you going to display your actual products, make them look attractive, offer them at different heights, like make the best use of your table to display as many products as you can, but also not make it look cluttered. There's a key art in that. And the other thing you'll want to make sure that you have are price displays. Because nobody, even the most confident person in the world, wants to ask the price of a product. So make sure that you have your prices displayed as close to the actual product that they relate to so that people know and can make a decision really quickly as to whether they want to buy it. And of course, even go as far as getting the money out of their bag. Next up, you want to be thinking about general signage. So this again, if you're not going down the kind of branded tablecloth route, you might have a branded banner. In terms of dressing your table, then you'll obviously want your products, very important. But especially if you're indoors and outdoors on a dark day, although this can be tricky sometimes in terms of electrical, um, you might want to consider lighting. Now, don't go crazy with this. Don't forget people have light sensitivities for various different reasons. But you obviously do want to make sure that you are showing your products in the best light. Excuse the pun. So you can get kind of table lights. You can get overhead light. You could even go down the route of like using kind of the like kitchen counter lights that go down. Again, it just depends on how you're dressing your table. There's lots of different options out there. You could even use some fairy light. The choices are honestly endless. And then you're also going to want to think about promotional items. So this could be something like a business card where people might not be ready to buy today, but they take your business card so that they know where your website is and can buy later. You might even go down the route of having some flyers which provide more information about your your product especially if it's not like a common product or you sell a product where people might have a lot of questions so it might be something sustainable or it might be like skincare like think along that route but generally just have things that help people either remember you or get to know you and get to know your products and why they might want them or again trust you as a small business owner moving on then to the third category and this is what i like to refer to as functional items because as someone who has participated in probably over a hundred events and has run probably at least 50 events I was trying to work it out in my head then probably about 50 events of various different sizes something always goes wrong and you want to be prepared so functional items again will look different again depending on what you sell or where you are but some of the basics you need firstly some sort of bag that people can carry products away with now again think about your brand here obviously if you are eco-friendly and sustainable you don't want to be giving out plastic bags so maybe you go down the route of paper bags but having something, especially if you have low cost products that are small, if people buy a lot of them, how are they going to carry them away? And not everyone still to this day carry 
these round kind of shopping bags with them. So you're going to want to have something that people can take away with them. Now, again, you can get started by doing this super basic by just getting kind of like generic things. Or you can even, if you really want to, go down the route of investing in some branded ones, if you so wish. You also want to make sure that you take a cash flow and some money with you. Now, my top tip here is to do not take a money tin. Not only do you have to leave it somewhere on the table, which is just super unsecure and it could get nicked, but if you do carry it around, it's also quite like lumpsome and heavy. Instead, what I recommend is getting some sort of bum bag that works as your cash float because one this is going to be attached to you so it's safe all the time plus this works as a great way to store your phone or put lip balm and things that you might need as well as taking cash you also want to have a card reader now i personally have and love the sum up card reader sum up there's the name I love this device. It is so easy to use. You do not need to be like super techie to use it. It also comes with this cute little promotional item that you can obviously put on your stand, which lets everyone know that you accept all the major cards and Google Pay, Apple Pay and all those. So it makes it easy for people who don't have cash to buy from you too. And sum up is definitely one of the ones that a lot of people use. So it's pretty well trusted. People are used to seeing these out and about. So if you're interested in learning more about the sum up card reader, I'll leave a link down below. And to go along with your card reader, a functional item that doesn't technically exist physically, but you will definitely need is phone data. Because obviously these card readers, any card reader, it works through connecting to the internet. So you'll need obviously your mobile phone and you'll need phone data in order to process the transactions. Now, this was the one question that I had when I got my sim reader. I was going to a huge event and I had no idea how much internet data it actually required. And as someone who doesn't use a lot of phone data because they're at home all the time and just use their Wi-Fi, um, I was like, do I have enough? And I actually got one of those like one off kind of add on to your bundle kind of phone datas and I didn't even touch it. So the sum up card reader and most of them, I presume, um, don't take a lot of data. But obviously that's something if you're someone who uses a lot of mobile data, obviously you might want to invest on an add on or increase your phone data to account for this. Doesn't use a lot, but just be aware of that. Um, obviously make sure you have enough on the day to deal with transactions. Then other things you're going to want in kind of like a fix it kit are calculator if you're not great at maths clipboard to potentially keep track of any sales that you make, as well as things like paper, pens, tape, scissors, cable ties, anything that you think you'll need to fix things, basically. Because like I say, traditionally something always breaks at every event, no matter what. Then the last kind of functional item I have on this list is to get yourself some kind of trolley or potentially consider using a suitcase with wheels to help you transport stuff from your car to your stand. Because again, it will depend on the type of event that you're doing. Sometimes it is much better to do everything in one trip because some of these events have like a kind of loading offloading bay and then you have to move your car. So you don't want to be doing multiple trips because you're going to annoy the organizers or it's not even the organizers. Then you're often talking about like security and stuff. And those people get antsy. <laughs> Plus anything like a trolley with wheels or a suitcase with wheels is just going to make it easier for you to transport heavier stuff or just like lots of stuff, especially if you're selling like small products, put them on a suitcase and then you can like unload the suitcase and then just put the suitcase back in the car and get it later. Then the last category, because craft markets can tend to be long days, you want your self-care items because you've obviously got to look after yourself during the day too. So this will depend again on the event or time of year, but dress appropriately, whether that is warm clothing or cold clothing, think layers and make sure you're wearing comfy and suitable shoes. Because let's say you're outdoors, you might be on a field, which can obviously get muddy if it's wet. Or if you're indoors, these kind of events tend to have like concrete floors that have a thin piece of carpet over the top and that is not comfortable to stand on all day. Other items then you obviously want to have on hand are snacks, because especially if you're doing a craft bar on your own, you're not going to be able to kind of go away and leave it unmanned to get snacks or lunch. So make sure you've got food on you to keep you going, plus water or any other kind of drinks that you want. Don't be afraid to take like a flask for a cup of tea or coffee. You'll thank yourself if you do, especially if you're doing like an outdoor event when it's cold. You'll probably also want to take things like lip balm, hand sanitizer, hand cream, tissues, 
And I highly recommend taking some sort of activity that you can do if it's quiet. And you could even use this in a marketing way. So let's say you're a digital illustrator. You could take your iPad with you and be working on sketching a new design during your quiet period. Because again, this is going to attract people to your stand. You're showing them a little bit of your process so that they can understand all the time it takes for you to create them. And especially if you're an introvert or maybe you're neurodivergent, it kind of gives you something to kind of do. Um, and obviously you can greet people, say hello and say if they have any questions, ask. Um, but it gives you that kind of um, safe space, if you like, to, like I say, do an activity, keeps you busy. Um, but it's also, if you can relate it to the products that you sell, it's also going to help you sell your products. So one of the items that we talked about there was a cash flow. And one of the questions I get so often is how much money should I take to a craft market? Now, again, this will depend on the size of the market. It will also depend on the products that you sell. It will also depend on how comfortable you are carrying money around, which is why I recommend taking a bum bag because it just makes you feel more secure carrying potentially a big cash flow. And don't forget your cash flow starts at a certain amount, but it's going to increase as you get sales through the day. So there was one event I know at the end of one day, I had probably about a thousand pounds on me, which is why I felt better with a bum bag because then no way I'm leaving a money tin on a table with that amount of money in it. So in terms of thinking how much money to take, you want to consider your product pricing first. What products do you sell at what price? So especially when we talk about in-person events, if you have products that sell for £9.99, and pence, you're going to need a hell of a lot of pennies in order to provide change. So it might be that you change your price for a craft events as opposed to online, and that's absolutely okay. Um, again, try to think of round numbers or maybe sell things for like £8 or £8.50. Again, if you sell things for £8.50, make sure you've got enough enough 50ps on you now in terms of getting that kind of change you can go to the bank and obviously let's say you hand over 20 pounds you can ask for 20 pounds worth of 50 pence pieces and you can go into any bank to do that it doesn't necessarily have to be your own bank although it'll probably be an easier process if you are already with that bank the thing to just be aware of is that there is a limit as to how much you can change i think the limit when i last did it was like 200 pounds so it's a pretty high limit but especially if you're making a cash float if, and you need more than that, then be aware that you might need to do different trips on two days in order to get enough for what you want. Moving on then to the next question that everyone asks, how much stock should I take? So for your first event, I recommend having enough to at least fill your tabletop. So again, it looks professional and it looks great. And then having a little bit of stock under your table in order to refill anything that sells. So this might look like you have one of everything on your table and then you have kind of like your best sellers. You have three of and then everything else you have like an extra one of. Obviously, it's difficult to know what will sell at each event. And sometimes it's completely different offline than it is online. But if you are already selling online, don't forget to use the data that you already have. So for instance, if you sell online and you have products that sell better than others, then you're probably for the first market at least going to want to take a more of those than other products because typically they sell better online. Now, especially important if you're taking multiple of like one product in the same color, don't put them all on your table. That is going to make your table look more like a car boot where everything's just splattered out and it's going to look really messy and cluttered and people are just going to go, oh, I don't even know what I'm looking at. Instead, put out one of each design or color and then have the others under your table to refill if that other one sells. Okay, so those are kind of like the basics that I always get asked. Now I have tons of top tips that I want to go through for kind of each stage of the craft market. So before, on the day, and then afterwards. And I'm just going to get started because I have a ton of these. So top tips before you've even said yes to do a craft market. First thing to think about, is it the right event for you? So think about, is this craft market somewhere that your target audience would visit? And also consider the date or time or time of year that it's happening. So for instance, farmers markets tend to happen on the weekend, it tends to be mostly local people, and it's going to be a mix of people, whether that's families, young couples, or even old couples. And they tend to be interested in looking at and buying cheaper products that are more consumable. 
Next, you'll want to book these craft events as soon as possible in order to get a good stand position. Now, sometimes if you've done the event before, you'll be given more preference than new participants. But as a rule of thumb, there's also a first come first basis. So you want to get your application in early in order to have the best pick or be allocated the better spots. Another thing to think about before you even say yes is what does your schedule look like? Because craft events take a lot of energy, not only in terms of making the stock for it, packing everything up, but also the actual day of. And I always recommend having the day off after, whether that you can in terms of work or not, but make sure you have some rest time planned for after a craft market, especially as an introvert, because they are draining. So you want to look at your actual calendar and think, do I have the energy to do this craft market in this week? So for instance, if you have a wedding the day before, that's going to take a lot of energy out of you the day before. Do you have energy to do a craft market the day after? Or especially if you want to do a lot of craft markets and you're working full time, do you want to be doing a craft market every Saturday for a whole month? Because if you're someone who needs some relaxation time, then that's a surefire way to burn yourself out. So you want to avoid that situation. Then the actual date of the craft market, it's a long day, whether that is, like I say, loading up your car or even if you've done that the night before, unpacking your car, designing your stand, doing the event packing it all away, going home, having dinner and chilling. Um, it's a long day. So you want to be thinking about how does the rest of your life function on that day? So if you have kids, a dog, other pets, like who's looking after those so that you can go off and do this thing. And then the last thing you want to be aware of or think about before you do a craft event is do you have the ability to do it and not make any money? So there's no guarantee to make back your stand price or even make a profit. So before you even book a craft fair, you have to be willing to make no money and in a sense, lose the fee that it costs you to do. Moving on then to the next bunch of tips, which are all about getting ready for your craft market. First up, make sure that you practice your display at least a week before the actual event. Don't do it a day or two before because that's not enough time to order something that you need from Amazon Prime or go to the shop or whatever. So make sure that you practice your actual stand design and layout and you know how to put on the tablecloth and all these things at least a week before so that you have time to fix it or learn how to do something or get more stuff. And make sure you take a photo so that you can easily recreate it on the day of. Whilst you're prepping for your craft market and thinking about what to sell, make sure your stand has a range of prices. Now, again, depending on the type of market that you're doing, but especially if there's going to be like families and kids there or teenagers, they're going to be more budget conscious and going to want cheaper products. So you want to make sure that you have some of those. But you also want to think about the fact that none of these people know anything about your business. So especially if you sell something that could have um, kind of lots of questions like soap, skincare, candles, like anything that people could be allergic to or it's scent based or like whatever. Think about having easy to try products, which again, tend to be on the cheaper side. Because although someone, especially with candles, like they can smell the candle and fall in love with it in person, which is so much easier than online where they can't. If they've not bought from you before or tried this certain product before, having like an entry product is also going to help you get sales on the day. Next tip, know your prices inside out. You, it's your business. You should know your prices, but also practice adding up. Yes, I've recommended taking a calculator and obviously you'll have a calculator on your phone, but especially if you're busy, you want things to be as quick and seamless as possible. So practice your maths in your head so that on the day you're capable of doing quick math in your head and you don't add it up wrong and potentially lose money. Next thing I think is really helpful is creating a packing checklist. Now, not only will this help you pack everything for the event but it's also going to help you pack everything after the event when you're tired and obviously make sure that you don't leave anything behind and when it comes to packing for your event do this the night before do not do it the morning of that is when mistakes can happen do it the night before so that you can get a good night's sleep and if you're anything like me think about that one thing that you didn't have on your checklist and you have to add in but give your brain that kind of space to go through the checklist or like have a moment of oh I've forgotten that and um, don't leave it to the day because that's where things get forgotten 
My next tip is to take a family member or a friend who can help you out. Now, whether this is just setting up your stand or packing it away, ideally, if you can find someone who's willing enough to help you, have them stay with you the whole day, even if they don't necessarily help you sell your products, but just to be kind of almost your gopher to get you lunch or to cover the stand if you need a comfort break to go to the toilet. Sometimes you will find some nice fellow stand members who will help you do this, but don't expect that to happen. Moving on then to my top tips for on the actual day of your craft market. First things first, be friendly, be approachable. Like I've said previously, if you are more introverted or maybe you're neurodivergent, it's okay to have something that helps you maybe manage your social anxiety more. But of course, as people approach, smile at them, interact with them and just answer any questions that they have in a friendly manner. My next tip is to utilize your under table space for storage. Now, this would be a great place to put any products that you can refill with after others have sold. It would also be a great place to put your self-care kit, which obviously includes like your lunch and your lip balm and all those things. But especially if you're taking part in an event where you have to park your car way away, this is also a good place to put your boxes or your suitcase, whatever you've taken your stuff in um, to help you pack up more quickly after the event too. Now, obviously, if you're doing that, it's essential to have a tablecloth so that that stuff is hidden, not only so it makes it secure, but that it looks professional too. Next up, if you do have a helper with you, don't forget to get them refreshments, especially if they're doing it for free, just to say thanks. Also, don't forget yourself in that too. If you're getting them a coffee, get yourself one too. My next top tip is don't refill your products too quickly. Spaces are good because it actually lets people know that things are selling, which makes your products look popular and it kind of gives off a FOMO vibe. So fear of missing out. If your stand looks like it's selling a lot, people want to come over and check it out to make sure that they're not going to miss out on what everyone else is loving. So it's okay for your stand to have spaces and to not look perfect. That will actually help you sell more sometimes. And then a tip along similar lines is don't be afraid to just chat to people. When people are walking past your stand, if it has people next to it that are stood there for a while, Again, this works kind of like FOMO. People want to know what's going on, especially if they can't even see the stand if it's surrounded by people. People will want to know what's going on, what am I missing out on? So even if someone isn't necessarily interested in buying, but just wants to ask questions, that's not a bad thing. That can actually help you again sell more through other people who are walking past. And then something to not let get to you on the day of the craft market is people walking past, maybe they have a little look, maybe they stop by, ask a few questions, but leave. Don't let that deflate you because most people will actually walk around event once, maybe twice, before they then decide what they're gonna buy and where they're gonna buy it from. So even though someone's walked past, they could come back. So keep an open mind. Don't let your negative thoughts kind of tell you that no one's interested or no one's buying. Instead, tell your mind monster that, oh, they could come back or someone else might come along in a minute. Keep yourself positive. And then a couple of top tips for after the market. You'll want to obviously evaluate how it went. Did you meet your goals? Did you not? Did you make your stand price back? Did you make a profit? But you also want to think about the non kind of monetary or sales things as well, especially if it's a first craft market or the first few craft markets that you do. You want to think about was there anything that you learned from it and everything that you learn from your first to your hundredth craft market you want to make a note of whether that's electronically on your computer in something like notion or whatever or an actual physical notebook write all your tips and notes and checklists down for your next craft market whether that's next weekend or next year so for instance products that sold well at a certain event A good one, which not only helps you at craft markets, but also in your other marketing are the questions that people asked you, especially if you get asked that question over and over again. That's something you want to think about in terms of improving your stand design. And you can even write notes about like which food truck was the best one to go to too. Then it's time to store your craft equipment away somewhere safe, secure, so that you can reuse it again in the future. And there you go. Those are all my top tips for taking part in your first craft market if you are a complete beginner. If you have any questions, obviously pop them in the comments. I will do my best to answer them. And if you found this video helpful, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new around here, subscribe for more videos just like this one. I'll see you again soon.